S.J. Stone Go, Gary Fife, Jaho Jeff Giddos, Muskogee Radio, Mabu Hedge and Wedgkies, and joining me here this morning is Liz Gray. Oh, very, very, t- very timid. Yeah. It's been a while. I'm scared. No. Yeah, well, it's good <laughs> to have you back. I enjoy uh, working with you. It's always fun. Now, we have um, a couple of things we'll be sharing here today. Now, uh, why don't you describe this first item real quick? first item is we're going to speak with Jenny Wilkerson from the University of Florida. She is a Muscogee Creek citizen who um, is studying pain and how uh, pain medication uh, can be individualized. You know, she wants, she's looking at research to kind of support that. Right. And in the uh, second segment of our program, we have uh, Denise McCleary joining us from the CASA program. Uh, that's the uh, court appointed. Uh, yeah, over here, I better read this. Uh, mm-hmm. Court appointed special advocate program. The uh, folks who uh, come in and kind of listen to the children who might be in the court system and kind of give them an ear and some help there. So uh, it's important, and there are a number of Muscogee kids, so she'll be sharing that information here first. But uh, first of all, let's let's go to work here. Uh, Ms. Wilkerson, are you with us here? Uh, Ms. Wilkerson. Hello. Okay, we're not uh, not hearing that. Ms. Wilkerson, are you with us? Okay. All right, try it again. Ms. Wilkerson, are you with us? Okay, well, we'll keep trying here. Uh, first of all, though, uh, you maybe you could yeah, explain. Yeah, let me give a, a little summary, you know, while we're working on that. Uh, Jenny Wilkerson, she is uh, with the University of Florida, the Department of Pharmacodynamics, and her research is summarized uh, as the examination of experimental preclinical compounds to produce analgesic effects with diminished drug abuse liability and okay. dependence. Let's try this again. Now, Ms. Wilkinson, are you with us? Oh, yes. That's so much better. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We weren't <laughs> pushing the right buttons again here. Oh, and I didn't, can't use the excuse for Monday morning either here. So, well, thank you for, uh, for making time with us. Now, um, uh, Liz here was just kind of a, giving us a, a real capsule of what uh, what your study is all about. But perhaps we can we can start there, and you can uh, explain explain what uh, your work is. Sure. <clears throat> uh, so it's my pleasure to be here to talk with you all today. So my research over the past. 12 years has really focused on the mechanisms of chronic pain and how chronic pain is different from normal protective pain and then how modulating the body's cannabinoid system can potentially produce therapeutic effects for chronic pain. And recently, my research has been, since the country is in the middle of an opioid epidemic, my research has really started to focus down on the opioid sparing effects of cannabinoids for pain and addiction related issues. Right. And whenever, let's uh, talk about uh, cannabinoids, for some people, you know, that's just uh, give an explanation of exactly what that is. Sure. So, marijuana contains over 100 different substances. And so, a lot of these substances bind to what are called cannabinoid receptors. So these are proteins that are in the body that interact with other proteins, and when they are interacted with other proteins, they produce a physiological response. And so, for example, marijuana contains delta-9-THC or tetrahydrocannabidiol, and so when THC acts on the cannabinoid type 1 receptor in the brain, it produces the subjective feeling of when you get high, and so that's how produces a high effect in the body. And so there are two known cannabinoid receptors, the cannabinoid type 1 receptor that I just mentioned that is well known to get people high. And there's the cannabinoid type 2 receptor that doesn't actually produce the same psychotropic effects to get people high, but it's also found on immune cells. And so 
we found that modulation of these this cannabinoid type 2 receptor on immune cells can have its own therapeutic effects aside from getting people high. Right. And what is the CD receptor? Right. Yeah. So let's talk about a little bit about the uh, therapeutic effects of uh, the cannabinoid oils. Uh, uh, just to, I think you were, were you meaning CBD oil? Yeah, CBD. Let's, uh, that's, okay. that's like the common, the common, you know, most people know about CBD. We have some CBD uh, places around here and mm -hmm. it's become a popular thing. And you have an article that um, really addresses, you know, if CBD is just a fad or if it's a rising star. And so that's... Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Liz. Um, so CBD does not work through either the cannabinoid type 1 receptor or the cannabinoid type 2 receptor. Mm -hmm. Like I mentioned in my article, it predominantly acts through what we believe is the serotonin receptor. And so um, specifically with regard to, so the only known therapeutic validated use of CBD is for pediatric intractable epilepsy. And so um, there has been a lot of interest in some work showing that, at least in animal models, the pain that CBD can potentially treat uh, some types of chronic pain. And so that's where there, we just don't know quite enough about the science to make really solid scientific conclusions on how well CBD will actually work in a human to treat chronic pain. Mm -hmm. Right, and so I was reading. I was reading your article, and a lot of it is animal studies, like rodent studies, of um, oh, what was the pain that you were focusing on with the rodent studies that you were hoping could probably uh, cross over to humans? So a lot of the work has been done in a chemotherapy model of pain. So cancer patients um, undergoing chemotherapy can often develop a type of painful neuropathy or nerve damage related pain. Um, due to their chemotherapy therapeutic use. And so that's, uh, we use an animal, we can do an animal model of that to kind of mimic what a human might be going through with chemotherapeutic um, agents. And so the studies that have been used in CBD have been, in animals have been in this type of chemotherapy model of pain. Right. Do you, do you expect uh, to see more research results uh, in in relation to uh, CBD and the effects on humans and their pain? Absolutely. So this is an era, a very, very hot area of research interest in the National Institutes of Health. Um, so this is an area where the research is only going to expand from here, which is a great thing because in order to really get patients really adequate pain control, um, we need to have the, this research conducted so we can know the science behind what is and what is not really going to work for patients, but also so um, we can have better regulation on these CBD oils. So I know we'll talk, probably talk about it in a little bit, but um, with regard to the claims of what CBD, CBD oil can and cannot do for uh, patients, is going to be really important to be able to address scientifically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you you had mentioned that in your article about um, in it had mentioned uh, under the headers Charlotte's Web of in June two thousand eight the Food and Drug Administration um, approved a treatment um, for the forms of epilepsy, the pediatric epilepsy, or that you were talking about. If you could kind of explain what um, I guess the obstacle, obstacles you face with the FDA are getting, you know, stuff approved and just kind of explain a little bit about that. Sure. So right now, a lot of the CBD that we work with in a laboratory setting comes from controlled uh, production from the National Institutes of Health. We have something called a drug supply program where we um, ask the National Institutes of Health to provide us with, uh, for example, in this case, CBD that we want to study. And so we know where it came from. We know exactly what it has in it and what it does not have in it. And uh, we know exactly all of its sources, everything like that. 
So uh, with that, the data I left, it came from a, Zurich, a company called GW Pharmaceuticals. And so GW Pharmaceuticals was able to have all of that information validated as far as where the CBD came from, exactly how much THC was and was not in the CBD product, and could definitely kind of have all of that information laid out. Mm-hmm. So that's hurdle number one, to know exactly what it is you're studying mm-hmm. in regard to CBD. Right, because the the CBD that we see in these stores aren't regulated. They don't have to have a certain amount. You know, there's no, I guess, information, you know, standardized information that has to go into it. And I think that whenever we talk about, oh, you know, have you tried CBD? This could work. But we don't really know. We don't have a control on what, you know, consumers are consuming, perhaps. Um, but I want to kind of go into, um, you studied at the University of New Mexico, and you said that there was a moment whenever you were there that really got you into studying pain and medicine. Um, I would like for you to kind of take us to that moment and explain what got you into the field that you're in today. Sure, thank you so much for asking me. So, As a graduate student, I was trying to figure out which laboratory I wanted to join at the University of New Mexico, and I had always thought of pain as a symptom of some diseases, but it never really hit home how fundamentally important the study of pain and chronic pain was until I was sitting in lunch, and where and heard from all the other professors in the department trying to get an idea of what lab we wanted to join and hearing about everyone's research until my former mentor, Dr. Aaron Milligan, got up and told the story about how for millions of patients that live every day in chronic pain and chronic pain in of itself can become its own disease. And for these patients that are living every day with chronic pain, they're often over, up until recently, they've been overlooked because, oh, pain, it's just in your brain. You're, you're making it all up for attention. And so these population of patients are never actually getting adequate care for something that they live with in every single day of their life with chronic pain, and it goes untreated. And so hearing that and hearing exactly how chronic pain and that can not only be a symptom of various other diseases, but its own disease in and of itself. And it's such an under-treated incident to really, really hit home and really struck a nerve with me, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Now, whenever, whenever you decided to, you know, go into pain study, um, I spoke with you before about... Um, your opioid research and pain and you had, you've written, you know, an article about um, how antidepressants can almost block the effects of opioids. And we kind of have this like gradual dependency on opioids and there's some genetic connection there as well. If you could just kind of go in and explain that um, to me. Sure. So the way how opioids work is they bind to and act on uh, opioid receptors. So there are several, several different classes of opioid receptors uh, with regard to what everyone thinks about as far as the actions of opioid receptors. That's commonly due to the new opioid receptor. And so with regard to genetic um, influences of the new opioid receptor and what that means for pain control and addiction, uh, it can specifically look at several different genes. So one of them is the OPRM1, or OPRM1 gene, as well as the COMP, or COMP gene. And so the OPRM1 gene encodes for uh, the mu opioid receptor, and variations in this OPRM1 gene are very, very well known to play a huge role in opioid addiction. And so then the COMP gene, the COMP, COMP gene, uh, is important for the influence of where and how many of these new opioid receptors are found in the brain. 
So this receptor is also very important for opioid addiction. And being native, it's important because, well, uh, some studies have shown that native genotypes can have variants with regard to these uh, opioid receptor genes that can influence native susceptibility to opioid addiction and dependence. Mm-hmm. And we were talking about, it, it's not not just genetic. Sometimes, you know, we talked about the map overlay of opioid addiction and, and uh, poverty-stricken areas. Absolutely. So it's really, really striking. Nora Volkov, the director of the National Institute on Drug Addiction, uh, last spring showed a map uh, in a drug addiction symposium seminar uh, showing exactly the overlay of the amount of opioid overdoses and addiction in the United States superimposed onto a map of poverty in the United States. And you can see very cleanly that there is a lot of overlap in those two areas. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I think that just kind of rounding it out with opioids, and CBD, there was there was something interesting because I had mentioned that I had back pain and I had uh, tried CBD and you had mentioned um, opioids effects on back pain. Correct. So there have been numerous studies recently that specifically with regard to opioid prescribing and opioid use for lower for back pain specifically tends to be very ineffective. So uh, physicians will prescribe opioids for pain, especially back pain, just to try to help a patient out. Um, But um, so actually that's another thing. So the American Medical Association and the American Pain Society are trying to have implemented new guidelines for opioid prescribing for chronic pain patients. And so it's really trying to get better therapeutics that are actually going to work for patients with chronic pain, such as lower back, with back pain. And so a lot of these recommendations are now showing that for patients with back pain, opioids should really probably not be prescribed because they're really not going to work very well. Mm-hmm. And what have you seen from that? What, besides, if opioids aren't going to work for back pain, which is seems to be a common thing, uh, what do you see as a solution? Do you think any of the studies that you've you know been doing could help with uh, resolving back pain? Uh, Potentially. So the area that I research doesn't specifically look at pain related to the back. I look at more of a um, kind of nerve injury related pain, so like sciatica, um, and then some of these uh, chemotherapeutic neuropathies and diabetic neuropathies. Um, But definitely it's an area that could definitely use some more research as far as the actual therapeutic use uh, potential. So right now I know baclofen is a GABA drug that can be used for muscle spasticity. Mm -hmm. And so muscle spasticity is obviously a massive uh, thing for chronic back pain patients. So um, but baclofen can have its own um, side effects. So these types of drugs that we're talking about so baclofen is FDA approved, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't have its own issues specifically related to respiratory depression. Mm-hmm. And so this is where conversations with your physician are definitely, but definitely important. So um, with things like cannabinoids and CBD, uh, it's just one of those things where it's better to have the conversation up front with your physician so that way you can have a, the best potential treatment plan for you. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to kind of round back, you know, to to um the the cannabinoids the uh, cannabinoid studies uh and our cannabinoid. There we go. Cannabinoid studies. I had yes. to say it about 3 times. Um cuz I'm just like, yeah, marijuana studies. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um so, you know, there's a big thing about like knowing the difference between CBD and THC. You know, if you're familiar with marijuana and kind of like if you follow it you kind of see and we talk about cbd now explain to me if there are any um 
benefits to the one to you know cannabis that has THC and if there are any benefits have you studied that and what have you seen from that so a lot of my research does not actually look at THC by itself it looks at the receptors that THC binds to mm-hmm. the CB1 and CB2 receptors okay so <clears throat> um, a lot of that work affects with regard to the receptors that THC acts on. So, I mean, that could be positive, but again, we just don't know enough to really make solid claims. Right. So there's a lot more to study as well. And so what I I have to ask, just kind of out of curiosity, um, what is your stance with, you know, legalization, there's been a lot of legalization in, in various states of, you know, of recreational marijuana. And here recently in Oklahoma, you know, we passed the medical marijuana. And mm-hmm. so what, you know, kind of, what is your stance on that? Do you, do you see this as a positive thing? Or do you think that it should be studied more, you know, as a, as a professional that that views this every day, you know, what are Mm -hmm. your thoughts on that? So overall, my stance is very neutral. Mm -hmm. So um, whether or not it gets legalized, fully legalized for recreational use or not, you know, I, I really am neutral with regard to that. Um, Just like whether or not it gets fully legalized for medicinal purposes, I have a fairly neutral stance. Although I think, um, with regard to the legalization process, I think those two lines of thought are definitely separate, and they should probably remain to be separate as far as uh, public policy concern. <clears throat> so legalizing uh, marijuana with the guise of being medicinal, when it's really the support is really more for recreational use, I think should definitely be... Um, not very um, well accepted. So I really just think that if you're advocating for medical use, you should advocate for medical use. If you're advocating for recreational use, you should really ask for recreational use and not kind of mix the two just for your own personal bias and personal kind of Right, Opinion. right, of like, oh, I take this for my glaucoma. That used to be a, a joke. <laughs> that's a, that's exactly. a joke. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Oh, man, I just, you know, can't sleep at night, you know, and which I've heard, like, there's different, there's different ways that people that they do see the benefits of medical marijuana, and then there's some people that are just kind of like, oh, cool, now it's legal, you know, so. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Yeah, so there there is a split. There does seem to be a split there. Um But, I mean, I appreciate, you know, you speaking on the subject. um, And you actually, I mean, you're very involved with uh, science. And uh, you are a part of several STEM um, organizations of helping STEM. And we had talked about this. And before Mm -hmm. we close out, I I just kind of want to talk about the interesting thing about how Native American, you know, scientists, people that are in STEM, kind of view the purpose of STEM a little bit differently. If you could kind of explain, you know, what you see as, as a scientist, you know, of how Native people view science. Sure. And um, thank you so much for circling back around to that point, Liz. So for myself, I did not have a clear uh, blueprint laid out for becoming a scientist. Uh, and being Native American. And so, for me, I was really, really, really driven to answer these types of scientific questions that are really important for the normal, average patient population out there. So, for me, this was not the cookie cutter pathway that my family, you know, that my, you know, my family is not scientists. So, It was not the standard of, okay, you're going to go become a, you know, get a PhD after you get your bachelor's degree after you graduate high school. That wasn't the path that was automatically laid out. So it was really something that I was passionate about. And because I have a Native background, because I'm in Muscogee Creek, 
um, I really, really, really kind of viewed the scientific questions from a different angle from a lot of my classmates and from a lot of my peers that I've noticed going through the STEM pipeline. So I tend to view the questions a little bit more kind of straightforward than a lot of some of the nuanced uh, terms that some of these questions, scientific questions can go down. And so I think um, being made of being a study freak has really, really helped me look at science in a different angle than a lot of my Caucasian uh, peers. Right. We were talking about um, we tend to focus on uh, the earth and the economy and, you know, protecting what we have and, you know, making sure of, uh, what, what did we say? Um, or what kind of, I had said before, trying, organic, yes, organic or a more organic approach to STEM. Um, but I think that that's, uh, that's great. I hope that we have more, more scientists, you know, uh, coming through Muscogee Creek Nation. I know we've, We've had plenty of JOM, our education department, they really promote this stuff, uh, this sort of subject. But I uh, really appreciate you joining us today. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I've, I've learned a lot. I hope everyone else did too. Yeah, thank you so very much for having me. It's been my pleasure. And I just wanted to mention for anyone that might have children, or anyone a little bit younger listening to this program, that really, if you have a passion for science, if you have a, a passion for asking questions, difficult questions that no one knows the answer to, then by all means, please follow that. Don't let anyone stifle your dream of potentially becoming a scientist or, you know, telling you that you shouldn't do this, that you should do something a little bit more, you know, that, that everyone else does. Because we need you. We need you to answer these really difficult questions that no one knows the answer to. And part of the reason we know we don't have these answers is because everyone's approaching them from the same angle. And so we really need more natives, more people from diverse diverse backgrounds to come at these questions from different angles to find better answers. Oh, that's that's inspiring. I hope that inspires someone right now. And inspires our future generation. So we're going to take a break and we're going to come back and talk about CASA. Please stay with us here on Muskogee Radio. Okay, welcome back to Muskogee Radio here on uh, The Brew. Uh, we appreciate you joining us here today. And also joining us here in the studio now is Denise McCleary, who is the volunteer for the CASA program. Now, I'm sure many of you have seen the TV commercials uh, involved uh, 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 involving the uh, clients, the, uh, the young faces there who, uh, who are asking for help uh, and support and volunteers for this program. But uh, Ms. McCleary, let's, uh, let's start right there. Uh, perhaps you can give us uh, kind of a capsule description of what CASA is all about. Good morning. CASA, which stands for Court Appointed Special Advocate. Um, I recruit and train volunteers to go to, ki- go to court with children that have been abused or neglected in, our, in the court system. Um, once a child has been abused, it's deemed that they have been abused or neglected and they are in DHS custody and in the court system, then the judge decides if she, uh, she or he would like a CASA on that case and we are the ones that would match that volunteer up with a CASA child or children and the judge signs an order to put that person on the case. And of course, uh, CASA stands up for the best interest of the child. Um, Nothing else. It's about what are the. It's about advocating for the needs of the child and making sure that they have a have happy, healthy place to call their own. So this is uh, part of the court system. Obviously, they're in the title court appointed a special advocate, right? So you are a resource that uh, the uh, legal system falls back on to assist in uh, the. Uh, 
well, I don't want to say prosecution, but uh, in, in, in the mechanics of a, a person's case, a young person's case. Right? We're actually a judges program, and CASA was created in 1977 in Seattle, Washington by a judge, and he uh, created this program because he wanted an extra set of eyes and ears on the case, and so he would have an independent, um, I guess you would say, view of how, how the child was doing during this process. And so, of course, the judge um, appoints us, and us being a judicial program, then of course uh, they can fall uh, fall back to us to check and ask things and see, because it's all about the child. Okay, so you talk about you know being an advocate. Yes. What are some of the things? What are some of the uh, things that go into being a child advocate? A child advocate needs to be 21 years of age, and then we also do background checks and interviews. That's a process, a screening process, to see if you're going to work well with the child and uh, how, t and also at some point to line you up perfectly with the case. And we do 30 hours of training, and uh, right now we have a really convenient way of getting that training. Part of it is online and part of it is in person. And you would, that in-person session would be one, uh, once a week for three hours in the CASA office, and it, it's a five-week program. Uh, and we do background checks. Oh, and I might should mention that we do have a training class, we call it CASA Flex Training, and it is coming up starting February 25th. And it's not too late to get enrolled in that class. And you can call and ask for Denise at 918-756-2549. When, once somebody uh, first uh, sees perhaps one of the TV commercials or something like that, it, it can be a bit intimidating, thinking, uh-oh, I'm gonna get dropped into this courtroom in this big important case, and I don't know a thing about any legal proceedings but you, you sort of take care of it. First of all, you don't call on them, a volunteer, to be a lawyer, right? But you uh, uh, want to be a, a set of ears for the young person, and you're not necessarily being called on for legal procedure. Right. We don't have to make um, those legal decisions. That's up to the judge, the district attorney's office, and to the attorneys. But we are aware of the laws so that we can make sure that whatever that child needs is falling within that guideline. And my job as a coordinator is to recruit and help train volunteers, but also when that volunteer is matched up with a case, then we will go along with them. We are there for them. We guide them all throughout that case. We're at court with them. We help them with the court report. Um, we never leave them alone. We are there for that volunteer. What kind of time investment are we talking about here? We ask that you see the child at least once a month because if you're going to go into court and make a recommendation or voice concerns, you need to know what's going on with that child. Maybe you're visiting in the foster home, maybe you're visiting, maybe the child is still at home or a group home. And also we want you to visit the, with the workers, whether it's uh, Indian Child Welfare Worker or DHS Worker. And uh, so we want to, you to be able to do that. Okay, now, um, uh, forgive our mic boom. <laughs> the uh, time in, a, in an actual courtroom, uh, maybe you can give us an idea of uh, how long a, a person could, quote, typically, unquote, be there. After your initial training, we do a three-hour courtroom observation, and then uh, when you get your case, um, depending where it is along in the process, if you're in state court, reviews are usually um, three months out, and actually in um, Creek Nation court, tribal court, is it can be 60 days to 90 days out. So you're not going to court every month or every week. And the time you put in to visiting the children and making phone calls, it doesn't have to all be in person. The child visit is 
face to face, but other things can be done on the phone, text, and email. So um, it, it really depends on the case and how um, serious it is and how many times you're going to have to go into court. But a person that won't look at, if they're working, they don't have to look at taking off work every month or every week because it, it doesn't work like that. Okay. Oh, sorry. I just, you know, going, you know, we're talking about child welfare and I mean, some of these cases, you know, can get pretty heart wrenching. Uh, and I guess I have to ask, like, what kind of person do you have to be to be able to handle that? If you want to be an advocate, what should you prepare for, you know, like, between sympathy, but also wanting to have the right thing done, you know, there's this, like, kind of this line of empathy for the child, wanting what's best, and then having to hear this terrible thing and see, you know, this child have to go through, you know, not maybe not having either of their parents, you know, or having a neglect, abuse, you know, and you see this and you want what's best, what kind of person, like, how strong do you have to be to be able to see all this and to sit through the court and, you know. And I feel like absolutely anyone can do this if they're trained in that. I, I feel like absolutely anyone can do this once they're trained. And initially, I believe the first case is going to be your difficult because you're finding your way and you're feeling everything that child is feeling and sometimes even the parents are feeling. And you get frustrated and you draw, draw full about different things. Uh, Self-care is going to be number one. Self-care is the best care. And myself and Nancy Hancock are the uh, CASA coordinators and we are there for your sounding board. We are there to help you through the difficult times and maybe something you it's just frustrating you but we can give you another uh, way of looking at it and we're there to help de- help you do stress and laugh sometimes well let me take that uh, Liz's question a step further uh, it obviously is going to draw on your emotional strength and uh, are there times when it just overwhelms a volunteer have you had to kind of a uh, prop someone up, so to speak, uh, uh, in in dealing with a particular case? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, that you can be overwhelmed easily. You know, it could be overwhelmed because you th- the volunteer thinks the case should go a certain way, but according to the law, the, the case goes a different way. And we definitely are there to hold their hand and talk to them and let them know this is not you. You've done what you could. You've been a good advocate, but also we have to go by the law. And sometimes children are returned home and you know that you know you have a gut feeling it's not going to work out. But according to the law, that's what you have to do. And, 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 And you have to work through it and figure out where to put that in your life or in your mind in dealing with it. Okay, so, you know, that's the that seems like the hard part of it, yes. but let's talk about the benefits of it. You know, have you been able to see that, like, yes, you know, we see a child almost succeed through our program because we were able to advocate for them? Most recently, I had a case close um, this month, and the children were in custody due to drug use and neglect of the parents and the parents are young and they seem to not be getting it together then all and then the CASA worker comes in and visit with the children visit with the parent uh, this child needs to have his hearing checked this child needs to have maybe the tonsils checked and those things help those children along and to flourish where they were kind of in uh, behind because of the neglect and then the parents got it together and the children were in a good healthy pay- place and they reunited as a family and then that case was dismissed and let me tell you uh, we clap and cheer and there are tears. I know I'm like toking up right now because I love that I love yes. to see you know like people do like you say young young parents you know they make mistakes yes. they make mistakes that no one is prepared for parenthood sometimes yes. you know like it's like no matter how, if you're on one end of like a social class or you know a financial class or you know a lower end which can affect you know there's so many different parts to it and again people make mistakes and for you to help 
not only the children, but sometimes you help the parents to get it together. You know, it's, it's, it can be heartbreaking. You know, you, you know what they say, they, you lose your kids, mm -hmm. you know, and I just, I, I love to hear that there, there is success and they just don't lose them forever. Yeah. And yes, there, there is a lot of success. And Okmulgee being a small town, there is not a huge amount of resources, but um, there are some resources available. And, and although we don't provide resources or can't certify a resource, we do try to make sure that the parents know where certain things are so that they can uh, work on their um, individual service plan, which corrects the conditions that led to the kids being in the court system. Uh, you mentioned a muggy there now. Uh, uh, maybe you can help us uh, look at may, uh, perhaps some numbers, uh, either of uh, Muskogee kids, uh, Okmulgee County kids, uh, and uh, perhaps a, a view of the national scene. Well, as of yesterday, there was 8,019 children in the child wel welfare custody in the state of Oklahoma. Okay. And of those children, 285 are Muskogee Creek children. Okay. And those would, are children you would call state custody because the tribe is not holding custody. They don't go to uh, tribal court for their cases, but those are in the DHS custody. And um, I don't know how many of those children are just Native American, but not... Mm -hmm. But not um, Creek Nation children. Mm, but the, gosh, the the number of Muskogee kids is staggering. There, mm -hmm. uh, what typically uh, brings them to court? And uh, we mentioned a couple of things: abuse uh, and neglect. Uh, perhaps you could define those or give us some examples. From my experience, the things I see in Okmulgee County is a lot of neglect. There is physical, emotional and sexual abuse in the county, uh, but a lot of it is um, neglect because of drug use, because of mental health issues, uh, because of domestic violence in the home. So that's uh, most of the cases we see. Now the, uh, the chances of uh, your input perhaps uh Affecting the case favorably, uh, do you have any feel for the success rate, I guess is what you might call it? I don't have the numbers on a success rate, uh, but the judge and the district attorney's office does take causes of report and information very seriously. We uh, lay out our concerns and our recommendations. Mm -hmm. And if it's some, if we're on a good spot, if it's within the legal uh, boundaries, then it's taken favorably. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of things on the educational process. Now, uh, the uh, if someone is uh, affected uh, to want to become a volunteer, uh, what kind of self-examination uh, should they, uh, they be taking? And uh, then when the formal training begins, uh, perhaps you could go over that again and, and give us an idea. So when someone kind of assesses their own personal strengths and weaknesses, what should they be looking for? First, we want them to uh, have interest in children and what, what a child's rights are and what their needs are. And that these little people are taken care of and taken seriously because they are our future and uh, just need to have time to devote to the training and um, the ability to work with family members of that child, uh, the child welfare system, the court system, and uh, also, of course, I said you need to be at least 21 years of age and can pass a background check. And um, also we need references and all of that plays into a screening process along with the application and the individual inter interview with the coordinator. Okay. And when you uh, begin the formal training process, you'll uh, provide the materials that would fill in the gaps if someone has not been legally educated or uh, uh, 
have the background in, in law that perhaps uh, might be useful there so you can kind of help them teach them, uh, give them this information? Yes, we will have uh, different areas. We will cover different subjects and what they need uh, to be prepared for to be a CASA volunteer. We'll talk about the, in, the role of a CASA volunteer, introduction to child welfare, uh, mental health, family strengths and weaknesses. Um, we'll talk about trauma, domestic violence, cultural diversity, and so forth and so on. And also, once they have uh, completed the initial training, we require 12 hours of in-service throughout the year. And so that could be going to a conference, that could be reading a book and, you know, kind of give us information on that. That could be watching a movie and giving us a summary of that. And sometimes we have you come in an office and have other service uh, professionals and providers come in and, and give that information. So you're not just dumping someone in a, in a courtroom and saying, go for it? Right? Absolutely not. We go with you out on your initial, initial visits, and we will always uh, go to court with, with the volunteer. And um, as we were talking earlier, I was talking about, you know, when you get a, a new job and you're kind of like, oh, I'm not sure about this. I don't know if I can do this. I'm really nervous. Maybe I've wrong, made the wrong decision. And then a week passes, and you feel a little better but then it's still kind of uh, iffy then two weeks then a month and you're thinking hey I think I can do this but I'm not saying that you're going to be a feel totally comfortable in one month I'm saying it's a process and it's ever-changing and everybody is always learning but it will be so worth it mm -hmm. uh, let me ask you a question Liz as a mother mm -hmm. um, what would you want to see uh, a CASA volunteer provide uh, for a, perhaps your child if it ended up theoretically in a court like that? What kind of things can you share if you're able? Um, I mean, I think as a mother, you want what is the best for your child. You want them to be protected. You want them to live, you know, a life that they're not exposed to anything that they know that they're safe safety is a big thing for my kids I am one of those moms that's like I almost helicopter mom sometimes mm -hmm. like where like if we go to the store they're in you know a range you know my kids don't really go anywhere <laughs> you know they live <laughs> with me a lot and so um I think as you know again Casa, you, you want to talk about safety and you want to make sure that they're going to be in a safe place, you know, uh, with, with, you know, with it. I mean, I, I have, you know, my own struggles here and there, you know, with, uh, with my children. And, you know, I've went through some court stuff before, you know, with custody. And that was the main concern with me is I had to kind of like take on, I was my own kid's advocate then, you know, but that's kind of why CASA is so important is because, I'm my kid's advocate because I'm their mother. Mm -hmm. But what if they don't have that? Mm -hmm. And that's where CASA comes in. And so that's how I see it. Uh, Denise, now how would you respond to those concerns? Absolutely. As a mother and a, a volunteer coordinator, and I have been the CASA volunteer as well, all you want is for the safety of children. My children are 23 and 29 and I'm still like where are you going, what you doing, <laughs> who you with and one is in Dallas and one is here mm. but I am still you never stop caring and wanting what's right for those children and uh, that's what CASA wants and just in listening to her talking about her children and wanting to be the advocate you have to be your best advocate, but when your when the parents are not there to advocate for their children, who's going to do it? If not you, then who? Who's going to do it? And then along the way, we won't say, well, what's wrong with those kids? Or I don't know what's wrong with the kids today. But as an adult, we didn't give that time to them. Children should be children, and they should be having fun, mm -hmm. not worried about the adult issues of the world. Now, when you're dealing uh, with a case and with, with children, you're, you're, uh, the kids are not the ones on trial. They are, per, let's call them the victims of a situation, correct? Right. 
the children are never at fault for abuse and neglect. Never. Absolutely not. We are adults and we should know better and do better. And we can't expect adult things from children. Mm -hmm. um, just kind of, I'm just interested, you know, because like my, my kids are younger, you know, so that's kind of like where the protection and your kids are older. What, what, what's some of the rage range that you see in a lot of CASA cases, maybe perhaps just here in Omogi? There's one case I can think of in particular. There's a child that's four and three, and then mom just had a baby this month. Then there's a 14-year-old girl. She doesn't have any siblings. Um, but a child ages out when they turn 18. They're, they're out of the system. But uh, like I'm saying, you could have a child from birth all the way up. Yeah, but you see that all range, and that's, I mean, that's different parts of development. And and we do have a lot of young children in the system. I have a volunteer who would like to have older children, and we've not had that to, to fit with that volunteer just yet. Mm -hmm. But it's a lot of young children in the system. You know, those formative years. Mm -hmm. Do you have enough uh, staff or volunteers to meet the need? Uh, well, you're here obviously uh, recruiting, which is fine with us. I mean, we'd love to help you if we can. But uh, what's the need there for volunteers, uh, numbers-wise? We cannot serve every child in our county, much less the Creek Nation jurisdiction. And we would like to be able to do that. There is such a great need for CASA volunteers. We've get, we get... DHS might ask us, do you have a cost of volunteer? The judge say, I would like a volunteer. And uh, the district attorney might say, it, even an attorney, but if we, don't have the if we don't have the volunteers, we can't put them on that. And as far as uh, going to tribal court, uh, we really need those volunteers. And we're looking at some point going into other areas of the Creek Nation jurisdiction and providing training in that area. And then um, they would be able to work as a CASA volunteer, but we are very short staff, staffed as far as volunteers are concerned. And it is our goal to save, serve every child, at least in Okmulgee County. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious now about the tribal court angle. Is there any difference uh, uh, between the Muskogee's, uh, Muskogee court and you know, a state or a county court? Uh? There, the difference is that in state court, a child can be any nationality or race. In tribal court, it's going to be specific to that tribe. So Muscogee Creek Nation are, are Creek children in tribal custody. The tribe has decided to, to uh, take custody of that child to intervene on, on behalf of that child. Okay, so, you know, we talked about numbers, and we talked about there was like 200 or so, you know, Muscogee Creek children. Um, how many are in our tribal courts? In the tribal court, there are 15 children right now, but as a tribe as well as DHS are shorthanded on um, on foster homes, and you know they would be best able to speak to that. But they are short. But right now, there are 15 children in the tribal, tribal court, which custody. is, I mean, that's still quite a bit. You know, where yes, our courts is. our courts not huge by by no means, so. And we're only able to serve one of them now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, mm -hmm. I, uh, man, I, I, the importance of it. I mean, the importance of it and the time that it takes. Because I mean, uh, the CASA trainings are are they in person? Are they online? Because you know, like, say, I work eight to five, mm -hmm. and I would like to, you know, to train or maybe you know volunteer myself. You know, what about that taking on the extra work? And what we call is our uh, our training is a, a flex learning and it's online independent study. And so Monday the 25th starts our online session. And then uh, Tuesday, March the 5th, you would just come in the office and what are we going to kind of go over what they've done online. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it is do done online at your own pace. And it's a five-week course. It's free. Uh, 
we feed you because you know people work and, and I'm in. No. Yeah. So we feed you. <laughs> All right. And so the in-person classes are about uh, how long do you think that those are? About two to three hours. Two to three hours. Okay. Yeah. And so where are you guys located? We are located at the Okmulgee County Family Resource Center. We're on that, that umbrella and you can reach me by calling 918-756 two five four nine for more information okay all right thank you denise cleary we appreciate you sharing this information and hopefully we've uh, done you some good by uh, interesting people in becoming volunteers for your program and we'll keep our eye on it and want to invite you back again when you've got another uh, uh, set of information to share with us and uh, we'll uh, wish you well and uh, Mado. thank you very much Mado. Okay, well, uh, we've got a few community announcements here to share, so uh, let me start off if uh, you've got a hankering for something really tasty for lunch. Uh, Benefit Indian Taco Sale coming up February the 22nd from 11 to 2, and that will be at the Mogi Indians Community Center here in Mogi. Six bucks is a taco and a can of pop. Okay, and we got... Uh the Thoplaco United Methodist Church All You Can Eat Wild Onion Dinner. Oh, I love those. Yes, uh, that's going to be March 16th at the Thoplaco UMC from 1 to 5. Adults are $10, children 12 and under 5, and children 2 and under eat free. So for more direct, uh, for directions or more info, call Beverly Parker at 918-346-0308. And it is that time of year when those wild onion dinners are uh, coming around. It's the season. So the next one is Little Casita uh, United Methodist Church. Another all-you-can-eat wild onion dinner on March the 23rd from 11 to 3 p.m. Adults 10 bucks, children ages 3 to 10, 7, children and 2, free. Uh, give a call to Karen King, 918-777-8242. Again, Little Cassetta, March the 23rd. Okay, ladies, come and be inspired, empowered, and shop until you drop. Uh, the Marketplace for Women is going to be held at the Glenpool Conference Center March 1st, uh, 12 p.m. to 8 p.m. and March 2nd, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, you can contact 918-857-1240 or 918-857-6630. And the Tourism and Recreation Department is seeking volunteers for another big event at the Muskogee Dome. They're hosting the Class 3 Area High School Basketball Playoffs for February the 28th through March the 2nd. Volunteer op opportunities are available. Get a hold of Kyle at, uh, uh, let's see, uh, extension 732-7990. Well, that dome has been getting a lot of use mm -hmm. lately. Oh, yeah. The uh, basketball uh, folks are having a great time there, I understand. Mm -hmm. And save the date because Spring Celebration is coming March 19th. It's open to youth ages 2 to 18 and also to the family. Uh, lunch is provided. There will be traditional games, door prizes, photo booth, haircuts, face painting, games, and more. We want to uh, say that's about all we can do here for, uh, for today's program. We appreciate you, you joining us and hopefully you can uh, help out some of the folks and Go eat some Devambaji. So Gary Five saying Mado. All right, this is Liz Gray saying Mado.